So today we are going to continue within our current series, Joy No Matter What, as we go through the book of Philippians. So today's scripture is going to be taken from Philippians 3, verses 8 to 14. If you are able to, I will ask you to stand in reverence of God's word. That's Philippians 3, verses 8 to 14. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings Becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have, not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to the mark of my own because of Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is already blessed. We thank you for the example, dear God, that Paul lived for us to follow because he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So I pray right now, dear God, you know that I'm not worthy, I'm not able, I'm not capable to declare, thus said the Lord, but you are. So use me now, dear God, as an oracle of God, all of you and none of me. I pray that every ear at the sound of my voice, dear God, that their hearts will be prepared to receive what you have for them, and that will produce ten. 20, 30, 100 fold food. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may have your seat. Today I'm going to be teaching today on the topic the pursuit of joy in Christ. Now, everyone in this room, and indeed, everyone in this world, whether they realize it or not, is pursuing something. That something can range from anything from the fundamental human needs of food, shelter, clothing, and basic survival, to more complex things like being loved, being happy, being a great parent, or spouse, being wealthy, being famous, or being successful. Now, while there is nothing wrong with any of these things inherently, but Paul is going to enlighten us today on the fact that these and many other worldly and temporal pursuits should not be the main motivator for any child of God. 
In these few verses, Paul is basically telling the church in Philippi, and by extension us, that their main pursuit or goal in life should be to become like Christ. As we go through these few verses today, line by line, we will see how this goal can be achieved. As mentioned last week by Elder Raymond, Paul has spent most of his life pursuing many worldly and fleshly endeavors and accomplishments which gave him the opportunity to boast of a superior religious status. This included his Jewish birth, his Hebrew heritage, his circumcision, his knowledge of the law, his position as a Pharisee, and his unmatched enthusiasm to be the main persecutor of the church. Notice all of these things had to do with him. But one fateful day, he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his life was forever totally changed. It was here that he accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of his life. So if you're taking notes, the first point today is the pursuit of joy in Christ starts with the joy of accepting Christ. After Paul accepted Christ, four things about him change. And we should also see these changes in the lives of other believers. First, accepting Christ changes your perspective. Philippians 3 verse 8 reads, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. After his encounter with Jesus, Paul quickly realized that everything that he has strived and worked hard for over the years paled in comparison to the joy and the benefits of accepting Christ. He said that he counted everything as worthless compared to the greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, his Lord. Now many persons has a negative or incorrect perspective about the gospel, which deters them, unfortunately, from accepting Jesus as their Savior and Lord. I, too, had one of these perspectives. I always felt deep down in my heart, don't know where it came from, but I always felt that the moment that I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, he would call me to preach. <laughs> Didn't want to be a preacher. Long hours. No pay. <laughs> I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And when I became an entrepreneur, it was even worse. I still prayed. I still believed in God, but I had that deep-seated fear that the moment I said yes to him, I would have to say yes to the pulpit. So I fought it. Until like Paul, I had an encounter with God. And he told me, you don't have to preach. Where you are right now is exactly where I want you to be. And that changed my perspective. I accepted him. I pursued him. 
And now I'm doing this too. <laughs> but if I had to give up, if he asked me to give up my profession, my business, I would do it in a heartbeat. Accepting Christ changes your perspective. Secondly, accepting Christ changes your priorities. The second part of verse 8 reads, For his sake, this is Paul speaking, I have suffered the loss of all things and condemned as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul's encounter with Christ completely changed his priorities. He happily gave up his position as us a Pharisee with all this honor, all this prestige, and all the security that it bought. He exchanged that life to a life of high risk by now publicly devoting himself to following Christ and telling others about Christ. Paul, who once was completely focused and had all of his fleshly desire on gaining a religious acumen as a sign of righteousness, now completely changed his priorities and is focusing on knowing Christ and telling others about Christ. This once persecutor of Christians has now become a Christian that is persecuted. Accepting Christ also changes your practices. Verse 9 reads, And to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of Christ from God that depends on faith. You see, Paul's life was centered around religious practices that required strict very strict adherence to the law. But after meeting Christ, he realized that none of those things matters. As salvation does not come from works, but from faith in God. Now instead of practicing or going through the motions of all the religious rituals, Paul is now living a life of humble service and devotion to his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and sharing the message of the gospel to the world. Which brings me to a critical point here. Many persons say that they have accepted Jesus as the Lord and the Savior of their lives but they really haven't. Now here's what I mean by that. Basically, many of us are able to accept the fact that we were sinners, that Christ died for us. He was nailed to the cross and he rose again. We accept him as Savior, but we don't accept him as Lord. We can't accept him as Lord because a Lord is a person who has control over you. A Lord is the person who calls the shot. A Lord is the person who says jump and you say hi like Devin. A Lord is someone who you're obedient to. But many of us, although we accept him as our Savior, we don't accept him as Lord because we are on that throne 
as Lord. We want to do what we feel like doing. We want to indulge in those sinful tendencies, even though we know they're wrong, they are bad for us, and they're harming us. But if we really want to live the joyful life that God has in store for us, if we lay it down for him and accept him as Lord of our lives. Finally, accepting Christ changes your portion. It changes your final destination. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our destiny is to no longer go to hell, which is where those who don't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior go. But when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we become joint heirs with him in his heavenly kingdom. And we will spend eternity with him and all of our loved ones who accepted him as Lord and Savior of our lives. Now after we've accepted Christ, we can now experience the joy of knowing him. Paul explains what he now wants to know about Christ. Verses 10 to 11 reads, That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and by all means possible. I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Paul wanted, first of all, to have a personal relationship with Christ. He wants to know the person of Christ. Many Christians only have a very limited knowledge of Christ. They know about his life, some of the things that he did. That's it. But that's just head knowledge rather than relationship knowledge or heart knowledge. Before becoming an entrepreneur, I used to work in the bank. I used to be a loans officer at the bank. There were three loans officers. Two ladies, and I was the only guy. And they had this problem customer that was kind of showing off. This lady didn't pay for her car in several months. And whenever the ladies in the office would tell her, you know, you got to pay or we come in to collect the vehicle, she would laugh at them. She was like, come get it, you bear, come get it. So I wanted to show off. I said to the ladies, you have a key, a spare key? They said, yes, right in the drawer. OK. Went there with the security officer. He dropped me, saw the vehicle, knocked on a lady's door. She didn't answer. I knew she was there. I'm like, OK. I went and moved the vehicle. Take the key, went inside. The security officer say, you okay? I said, yeah, okay, go, go, you go. <laughs> then I saw the door open. The lady was coming out. So I hurriedly put the key in the ignition and got it to start. Then I noticed something very interesting. It was a stick shift. <laughs> Sound 
that you all know the story, but I've never told the story. I just remembered last week when somebody was talking about stick shift. But anyway, I wasn't concerned because I knew that I learned how to drive on a stick shift. So I got this. I wasn't worried. Tried to move it. Couldn't move it. Then I realized, yes, I learned how to drive a stick shift, but I hadn't driven a stick shift in six years. So I was in trouble. The security was gone. <laughs> the lady and her brothers were coming out. The only thing that stopped them from ambushing me was that they were laughing so hard that I was showing off and couldn't move the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. That was the talk of the town for a little while. But that's how we are as Christians. My limited knowledge of stick shift didn't stop my zeal. I went over there saying, okay, that's cool, let me move it. But we don't know God. We don't know him. We don't spend time with him. We are not in his word. We don't know the person of Jesus. It's not enough just to know about Jesus and subscribe to his agenda. But when we become disciples of Christ, we enter into a relationship with the living Son of God. And we must work to deepen that relationship. No relationship can survive without proper communication and nurturing. Here at, our, at Harvest Bible Chapel, our vision is to make quality disciples of everyone that comes here by allowing them to grow deeper and to go further. To do this, we encourage everyone to practice the three W's. To worship Christ. By praising him. To walk with Christ. By prayer. Personal Bible study. Attendance at church. And, the, and attendance at D groups. Following his commands. Being obedient. And also working for Christ. Showing kindness to others. Serving others. Serving the community. Volunteering at church, volunteering at that wonderful place over there called Harvest Kids. That's what we do. Secondly, Paul wants to know the power of Christ and his resurrection. All disciples experience the power of Christ at the moment of their salvation. But as we go through life, the same power is available to us in our times of need. But the question is, have we ever chosen to access that power? Many of us go through some difficult stuff. We tell Tom, Dick, Harry, Jane, we tell everybody except God. Or we try to fix it ourselves. We do everything but pray. We have to access that power. Other times, when we're going through these things, it's God's way of purifying us and testing us. And as we walk by faith and trust God and commune with God, we get to experience the fact that he can do 
exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. But get this. When we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we also experience the power that raised him from the dead. The same mighty power of the Holy Spirit will help you to live a life that's pleasing to Christ. But before we can walk in the newness of life, we must let go of our old sinful patterns. Just as the resurrection gives Christ power, gives us Christ's power to live for him, his crucifixion marks the death of our old sinful and selfish nature. Now, I'm not saying that we become perfect at conversion. We never become perfect. But we can tap into God's power by crucifying our flesh in those sinful tendencies. This is a lifelong process that they call dying to self. Third, Paul wants us to know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. Mm. In other words, Paul is actually asking to get to know Christ by sharing in his sufferings suffering. Paul's a brave man. It's like Pastor Kenyatta mentioned earlier in this series. Once you accept Christ, he gives you two gifts. The gift of faith and the gift of suffering. Now obviously, everyone loves the gifts of faith, but no one wants the gift of suffering but they come as a package. You can't have one without the other. You see, it's similar to when you get married. The old people used to say, when you get married, you get the three rings. You get the engagement ring. You get the wedding ring. Then you get the suffering. That's what the old people say. <laughs> I ain't say that. I got one ring, not three. All right, wedding ring, that's it. <laughs> but Paul was praying for the opportunity to identify with Christ in his suffering. He understood that the sufferings united him with the Lord in a way like no other. Likewise, the sufferings that we endure can bring us into a realm of the same suffering that Jesus went through while he was on the cross. Now, nobody likes suffering. I don't like it. I hate it. I'd be like, God, please tell me what you want me to do straight up. I won't have to go through that and that and that. Just tell me and I can do it. I no problem. But I've been through some times of suffering in my life. And I was reflecting back on them a couple of weeks ago. And I realized they were difficult. They were stressful. They were frustrating. But boy, they kept me on my knees. They kept me humble. They, catch, they kept me with my eyes on Jesus. And as I think about them, I look at them now as precious memories of when I walked closely with my Savior and just trusted him. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. 
fact, it's proven. If you're here today, either you've come out of something, <laughs> you're in something, but you're going in something. But when you go, make sure you take Christ with you. Then we have joy in becoming like Christ. Verses 12 to 14 read, Not that I have already attained this, or I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. But as I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here Paul is describing the process of sanctification, which simply means that after you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he takes you through a process of where you become more like him. Paul is quick to affirm that he has not obtained this goal as yet, but rather he compares himself to a runner in a race who is pressing on to reach that goal. Paul also used the comparison of a runner in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27, which reads, Do you not know in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the ear. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, least after preaching to others, I myself may be disqualified. Paul uses these analogies as the runner to give us insight on experiencing the joy of becoming more like Christ. The first thing is, don't live in the past. Now, while your past can be used as, an, as a learning experience for previous mistakes, and even as a reminder of God's faithfulness and blessings, he never meant for you to live there. Looking back, can be especially dangerous in a race. Paul knew that if he focused on his past mistakes, it would have held him back. With guilt, fear, or regret. Similarly, if he focused on his accomplishments, like all the churches that he planted, the countless people that he led to Christ, or all the other things that he did for Christ. He might have had a prideful spirit. So he encourages all of us not to live in the past, whether it be 
past regrets, tragedies, mistakes, or victories. Don't live there. Also, with the past, we have to look at putting aside our old sins. You have to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Second, we have to press forward. Pressing means that there's some sort of opposition against you. I had planned the opposition during the past, since 4 a.m. on, I don't even know which day it is, because I haven't been sleeping. I was like, I don't know what's, what's going on. <laughs> but when you face opposition, it's not the time to give up. It's the time to look to Jesus and press into him in the midst of the opposition. When the opposition comes, you you press on. You press forward. You don't let it push you back. Run with endurance. This is a marathon, not a sprint. If you run fast, you're going to run out of energy and collapse. Run with endurance. The endurance comes from living with a mindset of eternity. Knowing that what you're going through now, Paul says the suffering of the present time cannot be compared to the glory of God that will be revealed in us. Christ promised to reward us if we faint not. And before I stay focused, Paul gives the analogy of people beating Boxing the wind. There are people like that. There are people who are on the treadmill of life. There are some people who have a lot. And they're breaking their back to get more. They can never spend this more. But they're breaking their backs for more and more and more. There are people who have these goals. And these goals are like what Paul said, you know. You get them, and then what? The Bible says that all of the things on the earth are perishing. They're temporal. We have to store up heavenly treasures. It's important for us to stay focused because every great biblical leader had unshakable, single-minded focus on God's purpose for them, even though the odds was against them. Abraham Focus on God's promise for a son. Joseph, focus on God's dream for him. Joshua, focus on God's promise of the land for his people. King David, long before he became king, Focus 
on God's promise to make him king. All of us have a better promise than that. Have a better goal than that now. The goal is to be like Christ. That song, Christ is enough for me. Is he really enough? Is the cross really before you and the world behind you? Are you going to press forward? Or let all those things make you turn back? Number five, practice discipline and self-control. The sanctification process is a very, very difficult one that requires us to get the help of the Holy Spirit to work on our many difficult character traits, sinful patterns, strongholds, selfish tendencies. I mean, honestly, the older I get, I still now realizing I had baggage from back then. We all have it. But if you are in Christ, he's using various things to work out that sanctification process in you. Practice self-control. Practice discipline. Crucify your flesh. If you're having problems, Get an accountability partner. Finally, leave a godly legacy. I find that a lot of people don't care about this today. What profited? A man, if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul, what profited a disciple, a child of God, if he walked with the Lord so long and he allowed the enemy? to distract him and make him make a mistake. Now God, his infinite wisdom, uses those mistakes still for his good and for his glory. But the goal is to be like Christ. Paul Started off bad. Big persecutor of Christians. But in the end, he allowed God to turn his life around. And he was able to boldly say, well, the shadow of a doubt, follow me as I follow Christ. He wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 79, I have fought the good fight. I have stayed on course and finished the race. And through it all, I kept on believing. In the same way, we are to focus on that godly legacy for our families, for our friends, for the countless people who are watching you and looking up to you and you don't even know it. 
The Bible says, don't let your good be evilly spoken of. We have to guard our Christian character with our life and hold on to it because it really is our legacy. It's not what we leave for people. It's what we leave in people that counts. So end where I began. What are you pursuing? Stephen Covey wrote the popular book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's one of the best business books ever written, a bestseller. And in the first chapter, I'll never forget it. He said, imagine yourself inside of a room, a room just like this. People who you know. And they're all dressed in black. And they're all sad and somber, some crying. You quickly realize you are at your own funeral. What do you want them to say about you? Think about that. What do you want people to say about you? Once you have determined that, live your life with that goal in mind. Let us pray.